Okay. Is it working? I believe it is. All right. You might, you might check that and make sure. I will. Thank you. You're welcome. Peter. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says that it is, uh, he almost contradicts the creation story because he says that it's probably better for you to be alone, not to be married. Now concerning the things in which you wrote to me, and obviously the church had written to him and asked some questions about being married, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Easy for him to say, isn't it? And then in verse 28, But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh. It's good that you not be married, he says, because they run to persecution. But if you do get married, you will have trouble. You guys believe that marriage is troubling at times? Hello? So is being single. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, I also want to read a verse. Uh, this is a, a Proverbs chapter. This, this really has nothing to do with our lesson today, but it was just uh, nuggets that I picked up along the way, and I want, I want to give these to you. Actually, I stole it, uh, this one from uh, Mark Gunger as I was watching the video of Laura's this last uh, week. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4 says, <clears throat> where, the, <clears throat> where the auction oxen are, the trough is aren't. Where there are no oxen, the trough is clean. What does that mean? There's no poo in the stall if there's no oxen, right? Now, Callie was a veterinarian. She knows that for sure. <laughs> Where there are animals, you have to clean the stall out every once in a while. I remember as a kid going to the barn, and we hadn't cleaned the stall out very well. And so you had to wear rubber boots. And and I was told my mom when I went back, I think it would be better for us to just sell that cow and seal the barn up. <laughs> that would be one way to resolve the issue. Right? <laughs> That's what he's talking about. Where the, where the oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of the ox. So here's what he's suggesting. That if you have oxen, it's going to take work. Uh, when you, if you have horses or cows or whatever, and you look at to the stalls and you realize how, how much poo is in the stalls, you start wondering if, uh, sounds like we're having a... <laughs> somebody's having fun. Uh, you you, uh, you want to just sell the oxen and give it up. But the truth is, he says, that when you have oxen, there's an increase. Uh, lots of things that you accomplish. Marriage is not easy. It's hard. At best, it's difficult. There will be problems that you will have. My son, Aaron, and Kelly just got back from a week of intense marriage seminar. Aaron has said many times before that there are times when he wouldn't take a million dollars for Kelly. There are other times he would sell her for a Diet Coke. And I'm sure that probably most of us have felt the same way, right? There are times that you want to be around the person you're married to, and there are times you can hardly stand each other. Thank the Lord it doesn't last. But if you, if you measure your relationship by the stuff that you have to do and how difficult it is to take the old uh, pitchfork and get in there and throw the stuff out of there and work hard and that kind of stuff and then you start asking yourself is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? I can tell you having been married 53 years it's worth every day. Now that I've just about got my wife straightened out <laughs> it is worth all the time and energy that 
I have spent to get her corrected. This is reported, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> she and I went to the doctor here some time ago. Maybe you've heard me tell this story, but you know, she, my wife is, she is uh, the kind of person who, when a grain of dust flies in the air, it's scared of her when she walks into the living room, it flies the other way because it knows she's coming after it. Uh, she gets all of my medication. I went to the urologist here some time ago and I was supposed to take some medication before I got to the urologist. And he said, did you take your medication? And I said, my wife didn't tell me I had to take medication. He said, what? You depend on your wife to tell you that you got to take your medication? I said, she always has. When I take my medication in the morning, it's all there. That's, I didn't tell her she had to do that. That's something she's always done because she chooses to do that. She went to the doctor with me. And uh, <clears throat> she said, I'm going with you, and we're going to have a talk with <laughs> the doctor. I was a little bit lethargic and that kind of stuff, probably because I was eating too much, several other things, eating the wrong kind of things. She said to Dr. Ting, now, listen to me. He's a good man. We got to get him well. And I never said a word, but I thought to myself, now that woman knows a good hunt of flesh when she sees it. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew, Dr. Ting knew, that she was serious. That's my wife. Uh, anyway, there have been lots of battles in our life, lots of stalls that have had to be cleaned out, but it's been worth it every bit of it. Now, today I want us to. Uh, Talk about who we are. In my approach to marriage counseling, my approach is that we try to help folks find out who they are so they can decide whether or not they want to change. In order for us to resolve a problem, we have to first of all understand what the problem is. So the lesson is entitled when the design is affected. There's a book that we have, I think, written down here called Self Therapy by Jay Early. It's not a Christian book. I don't agree with everything that he says, but it, I recommend the book because I learned a lot of it. When a child is born, comes into the world, Jerry Smalley says, <coughs> there is nothing more that this child needs than to have a safe relationship. If somehow the, their, this child does not feel safe, and what I'm talking about is he grows up with parents who uh, do not make him feel safe by complimenting him, nurturing him, uh, holding him, the little marsupials that, that crawl up into the little uh, bag and they stay there for days. That's by design, obviously. Hello there. So, um, Uniquely, um, those uh, little fellas need nurture. Now I got to tell you, gals, I did a little research some time ago about strong leaders, and one of the things I have determined about strong leaders is that almost always strong leaders have had a very nurturing mother. That's not always the case, but pretty much three the three worst. Leaders that I know of in history, Hussein, Stalin, and uh, Hitler, all three had a very nurturing mom, but had terrible dads. Hussein had actually two fathers that so he wasn't sure which one was his dad. Hitler's dad would, I guess, and I'm told, would literally knock him unconscious when he was a kid. Uh, one of the presidents, and I can't remember which one, <laughs> he'll come to me in a little bit. See, the first thing goes is your mind. Once you get over 70, you can always say, I don't remember that. And it's really valid. Uh, and, I, and I really don't remember uh, <coughs> Roosevelt. Not uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the other Roosevelt. His mother lived with him in the White House. Um, in uh, Dr. Kevin Lehman's book, The Birth Order Book, he says that most presidents are the oldest child or an only child. 
but they also have to have some other qualities, like they have to they have to be nurtured into believing that they are very capable of doing some unique things. And so, when this child comes into the world, if if uh, moms and, and moms, I believe, have more of a part when they're earlier than, than we dads do. Dads, many of them are busy working, creating a <clears throat> security, they think, for their child. And as a result of that, there's uh, very little nurturing. Here's some things that we know that study, good studies have been done. A, a girl who was raised in a home with a unnurturing dad, well, always, many times, not always, but many times, will become promiscuous. How do you spell this? Promiscuous. Is that C U S? S C U S? That's what I'll put. You guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, I, I don't. I don't write to spell it right. I write so that you understand what I'm talking about. Girls who have a unnurturing dad. Um, are, need male approval, so they, in many cases, will become promiscuous just so that they can be approved by men in their life. I didn't say that. Some studies indicate that. Uh, the other thing is that when boys, when uh, boys grow up without a nurturing mom, many cases, not all, many cases, will become hooked on pornography. Now uh, here's my explanation for that. It's my contention that that um, God has given us a mom and a dad to model for us and to be the nurturing encouragement that we need to know how to deal with life. Boys need proper nurturing from their mom. And if they don't get that, they become then a little bit hesitant to be connected to the opposite sex because of mom's uh, set a standard for them, and if that, if that doesn't happen, then this need to have a female relationship in their life becomes, they internalize it, and it becomes something that they do in secret, which in some cases turns out to be pornography. Now here are some other things that happen, and I'm going to ask you guys before we go through our thing today, here are some other things that this child does in order to find a safe place. If this child does not find safety with its mom or its dad, then we need another safe place. So we will look for uh, places where uh, we can be safe. Some kids turn out to be loners. We're going to go through that in a little bit. Uh, some turn out to be performance driven. <coughs> Uh, because at some point in this child's life, they didn't feel connected to their mom or their dad, and they do something, like they clean their room or whatever, and the mom says, oh gosh, look at how well he did, he cleaned up his room. So, uh, what does this child do then from that point on? Cleaning his room, he relates to being safe. And so performing is how he gets approval from his parents. Now, I think this is the same way that workaholics are made. At some point in a child's life here, uh, he has, uh, uh, out working with his dad or whatever, and he's reminded about how special he is that he gets all this stuff done. So this child becomes performance driven or a perfectionist. This is also where addictions take place. Addictions have more than just behavior here. Sometimes they're modeled from our parents, but, but also I believe that um, addictions become a safe place for a child to hide. When there's so much stress to perform, um, or they're not accepted, next Sunday Aaron and I will talk about why it's important for kids to be nurtured and you know, we weren't perfect parents. Um, Aaron will be the first to tell you that. My oldest son even more. Um, but we did some things right. 
but we struggle to be the nurturing parents when they were in this uh, huge nurturing need. We struggle to nurture our kids. <coughs> now, one of the first things, class, that I do when couples come to see me is I ask them about their parents. Because in telling me about the relationship with their parents and how their parents' relationship is will tell me a lot about who you are. If a girl is raised in a home where her mom is the ruling person and she tells everybody else where to go and where to get off and that kind of stuff, what's this little girl going to feel like her role in marriage relationship is all about? Yeah, you don't want to be in charge. You're going to be, and I ask uh, the, the person, how are you like your mom? Gosh, I said I'd never be like my mom. My next question is, well, how's that working for you? <laughs> Not very well. Because there's too many times that I'm just like my mom. Or uh, the boy grows up with a dad uh, who has a certain personality and the mom <clears throat> catered to the dad even when he got mad and angry and demonstrated anger in the house and that kind of stuff. And uh, um, he saw every time his dad wanted something that his mom catered to that. What's he going to expect from his wife when he gets married? Hello? Absolutely. Uh, when a mom dotes over her son, he doesn't get along very well with his dad because his dad's too demanding from him, so he, he kind of migrates to his mom, and she's this nurturing, caring individual who uh, loves her son. And, and, uh, and because her and, and his dad haven't gotten along very well, there's been very little, very little connection between the two of them. Parent, moms, gals, always pour themselves into their kids. You girls need somebody to nurture. So what you wind up doing then is you pour your nurturing into your kids. The dad comes home and he feels like it's mom and the kids against him. Sometimes he earns that. But now when this boy gets married then and he marries a gal who, grew, who came up in a home where that was not the case, where uh, he was somewhat functional, and he says to his wife, um, you know, my mom sacrificed a lot. She kept her house clean, and you don't keep a clean house. What's that all about? And some of you girls want to say, I am not your mom. <laughs> don't be, be me like your mom. Uh, but, <clears throat> He wants to, her to be just like his mom because that's what was demonstrated for him. Now, if he's not a very loving, caring person to his wife nor his kids, then what? how's that going to uh, appear? How's it going to manifest itself as the child gets older and the marriage relationship starts to unfold? You can say... Some of you guys, I can almost guarantee you're dealing with this right now. If you aren't dealing with it, you're going to deal with it in time to come. The child will manipulate both parents against each other. Sometimes that's the case. And, uh, or sometimes the, the child, in order to try to achieve, if they don't feel like that they're getting nurtured, uh, especially if it's a remarried situation. A child, let's say this is the mom and the child brought into a home where there's just a dad. This child knows if he's been doted over by his mom for a period of time, in many cases, that he can run to his mom and get, get attention all the time. Does that create a problem? What kind of problems would that create? Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Now, I would almost bet that every one of you, if I were to ask you individually to tell me, are a victim of generational sin. You are a victim of sin that's been passed down from generation to generation where the father was too uh, overbearing, the, the mom was too much in control, uh, whatever it is. Uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 says, the sins of the father is going to be visited to the third and fourth generation. There are, there are situations that you will be a victim of as time goes along. Now, you, you bring these two people from two different paradigms together, and they try to, uh, they try to blend their life together, and guess what happens? <clears throat> well, you guys know what happens. Now, I'm going to ask for some volunteers. Before we go through these, uh, these things here, I'm going to ask for some volunteers. Tell me, give me some examples in your own relationship that you have felt the power of your parents' influence in your or your spouse's life. When you were talking about feeling safe, uh, for me, it was definitely performance. But that was something that was very important in our household, especially my mom. She still is, can be pretty critical. And so I'm a high achiever performance, and, and I struggle with that. You know, how has that affected your and Rick's relationship? I definitely have that tendency toward him because that was not to me. Okay. God is healing that, but... Yeah. So, have you ever criticized Rick for... You, you wouldn't do that, would you, Dan Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you critical whenever you... When things are a task are to be done? I can be. God is doing a lot of healing in it. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling guilty about it, and that's why you're saying that. And I understand that. But let's talk about your kids. Were you critical of your kids? I was very careful with them. Not that I never was, but because that was done in my household, and you know, I had a walk with God as a, as a young mom. I was very careful to not, but I think it probably, I'm sure it came out in other ways, just as far as my cheating yes. um, could be, you know, sort of some, something hard uh, yeah. for maybe them to yeah. obtain or be threatened. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it has had an effect. Rick, have you ever been angry at your wife? Yes. Were you ever withdrawn from her? Yes. Was it because she was too demanding? Yes. Got that figured out in her. <laughs> yeah. And Kelly, if I were to add, if you guys had come to see me and I were to say, Kelly, are you like your mom? Uh, I always tried to be, not to be. And I'm sure that's what you would have said. And and you would have said then, God's delivered me from that too, to help, help side the guilt that you're feeling. Uh, which is a good thing. I'm not trying to put that down. But uh, do you understand what we're talking about is that you are bringing a paradigm with you and when it doesn't function right, if you don't have a place to go where you can submit yourself to God's leading and realize that, that there's poo in the stall, we have to clean up the poo. The stall's full of poo. And when, when uh, Rick would say, you're acting just like your mom, how did that make you feel? Make you feel good? <laughs> now, any of the rest of you have know where Kelly's coming from? <clears throat> yeah, my dad would withdraw. My mom was more, she wanted to communicate, so she tried to be you know, to try to get stuff going, and he would kind of pout if he got his feelings hurt. So I tend to do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, do you know much about your dad, uh, past life, though? 
Yeah, I grew up as a child. Was, what was that like? His dad was really distant, not really involved. Um, Isn't that amazing? Now we know three generations that are affected by the yeah. same plague, right? Yeah. <laughs> we men have a tendency to stonewall because we don't like to share our feelings anyway. But already three generations have been affected. I would imagine if you go back another generation or two, it was probably just like that. That's been passed down from generation to generation. And class, unless you start, unless you start understanding some things about yourself and start owning that, you are going to you're going to involve yourself in the same attributes that your parents demonstrated to each other. Make sense? Now, how many of you girls feel like you run you run the show in your relationship? Really? <laughs> okay. No. Uh, <laughs> We don't want to embarrass anybody. And you know, we will only ask you to, to share when you want to volunteer. You don't have to, we don't put anybody on the spot, but we, we do want you to understand some dynamics that are happening in your relationship. Now, what's your first name? Sarah. Sarah, does your husband expect you to run the show at your house? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Do you feel like you go overboard? Sometimes. Do you feel guilty about that? Sometimes. Okay. Now, Sarah, did you have a domineering mom? Kind of. <laughs> You're right on the cutting edge, sort of. Kind of. <laughs> well, my guess is, yep, yep, you hit it right on the nail and the hobby. Does your husband withdraw? Yes. You pounce. I don't know if you call it pouting, he just kind of shuts down and okay. just says it's Now, you know what I find interesting is that we're almost always attracted to somebody who, who will allow us to play out the role that we feel that is uh, apparent to our, our relationship, our childhood relationship. If your husband was domineering, you guys would never have gotten married. Yeah, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sarah, let me ask you. I assume the reason you're here in, the, in this marriage class is because you want to know how to do marriage better, yes. right? So, uh, is it working where you guys are? No. <laughs> Not at all. Okay. Uh, so, tell me a little bit about his dad. Was his dad a domineering person, or...? What was his mom and dad's relationship like? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, his mom is very quiet and reserved. Um, I don't, I wouldn't see her as domineering, but I wouldn't see his dad like that either. Um, okay. They're both very laid back people. So did she, uh, did she tote over your husband? Were they, were they close or not close? They were close. Or him and his mom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you guys need to come and see me. That's what I was going to talk to you about <laughs> after class. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much to stretch this thing out because I don't want to lay all your laundry out in the open, but I just want you to understand some dynamics. You're here because of a generational sin. You're here because you brought a paradigm with you to your relationship. And if you keep acting out the same relationship, we all have to admit, I came from a dysfunctional family. My mom and dad were extremely dysfunctional. I brought that relationship with me into my wife and my relationship. She, if she were here, she'd disagree with me, but her family was dysfunctional also. So two dysfunctional people trying to blend this thing together and guess what? There's been a lot of poo in the stone. Gosh, we've had to dig and shovel. <laughs> and you know what? We see our kids bearing out the same thing. I, I gotta tell you guys a secret. This confession time. I have the worst 
garage in the world. My garage is full of junk. <laughs> My Aaron has said to me, Dad, what are you going to do with that, all of that? You know when you die, we're just going to have to haul that to the dump. And I tell him, yep, that's true. The interesting thing, when I go to visit my kids, their garage is the same way. <laughs> they have as much junk in their, in their, they have as much poo in their stall as I have in mine. It's because I taught them that. They learned that by modeling. And you know, class, I've had to apologize, especially to my older son. I've had to apologize to him a number of times. Mike, when, when you were little, I was too hard on you. I got this bright idea from a lady who was actually a, a, a nun who did counseling one time. And uh, she, when she'd go visit with a family, she would take a little clay pot with her. And uh, she would sit with a family and have each member in the family to write down two things to describe everybody else in the family. And so we did that with our, with our family. My oldest son, Mike, one of his criticisms about me is that I was overbearing. When he read that, you know what I said to him? Mike, I am not overbearing. And he said, see that? See, that's what I'm talking about. I was overbearing. And because I was overbearing, I took away his ability to be a super achiever. He was afraid to make a mistake. He's uh, 50 years old now, and he still suffers from what I put him through. I have to own that. I'm trying to be a better dad. I'm trying to be a better husband, and I just about got it all down pat. In fact, I'm just almost right on the cutting edge of being perfect. <laughs> you ask my wife, you can she'd tell you. No, she'd say he's not perfect. Uh, can I can I ask you some some questions? You know, this is more fun for me than doing the actual. <coughs> we'll come back and run through the answers real quick. But this, I, I I I can almost tell you, from some of you who have been sitting here, I can almost tell you where you are in your relationship. Jessica, can I embarrass you and Luke? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You said at some point that your mom was a dominating person? Yeah. Okay. That trait is passed along to you? Yeah. Okay. How's that worked in your guys' relationship? Um, well, we reckon, like in our conversations, we've talked about how my forwardness and my directness sometimes can make conversations happen that wouldn't happen. Um, so would you see that as a good thing? No. <laughs> okay. I'm presenting that it's a double-edged sword because okay. also, like, because we've talked about if I wasn't direct, there would be conversations that would never happen. Okay. But on the other hand, my directness can also be off-putting and be input that's not desired. And okay. so it can alienate my husband. <clears throat> yes. Now, Luke, have you ever been angry at Jessica? Yes. Do you get frustrated at her at her direct approach? And uh, sometimes, yes. Sometimes I need to kick in the pants, though. So okay. I mean, well, you know, I, I like the fact that you're on in part of that. If you could, if you if you could uh, change Jessica a little bit, what would you tell her that would probably help your guys' relationship? That, is that putting you on the spot too much? Well, I just I don't know that I have a direct answer to that. I okay, well let me help you out. <laughs> well, let me let me let me help you say something. Before that, though, I need to know some a little bit of your background. Mm -hmm. Look, tell me about your parents' relationship. Okay. Um, so my parents both worked when I was growing up. My mom was a teacher. My dad uh, was a little bit more of a full-time employer, though, um, as far as he worked pretty early in the morning until the evening. Um, they, so they worked in a team there and then we moved when I was going to high school and my dad was the only one working at that point. So then my mom was a stay-at-home mom um, from then on. 
uh, both my parents my parents met. Uh, my grandfather was the pastor at the church that um, my mom's family went to, and they met through that through the church that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so they had a good foundation in that. Um, what else would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of relationship did your mom and dad have? Uh, I feel a very caring one, um, one where they would work things out. I think that at times my dad might avoid um, some of the conflict, but... Really? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, do you avoid some of the conflict? Absolutely. Okay. And Jessica, how do you feel about it when he avoids it, doesn't talk about it? Um, well, so that's part of my mom's, like, having her group. <coughs> the journey. Her parents didn't... She talked a lot about how her parents did not share their conflicts with her when she was a young person. Uh So when she got married, she had this experience of thinking, like, why would married people fight or have a conflict or disagreement? Uh And so through that journey of her with with my dad, she had a really pointed mission of sharing that experience with us, the children, so that we would know that conflict is there and how can we approach it to resolve it. And I think part of her journey came from this idea of, you know, I'm not coming here to change my husband. I'm coming here to figure out what can I add to my relationship to make it work. Okay. And so coming from that perspective, I kind of had this approach of like, well, you know, that's him. I'm not going to change him. So I need to find a way to make it work with what his process is. Okay. So why why are you, why do you insist on, are you abrasive at times when you confront Luke? Yes. Okay. Uh, Is that necessary? Sometimes. (laughs) Sometimes. <laughs> okay. You're okay with that? Mm-hmm. Well, good for you. Not, I mean, not all the time. There right. are ways right. that I can yeah, soften yeah, and yeah. improve my yeah. communication. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes it's needed, yeah. Okay. So, do um, you guys ever... Uh, Emerson Eckridge calls it the crazy sock. When men don't feel like they're being honored or respected, women don't feel like they're being loved. We go in this crazy sock where we kind of avoid each other or whatever. You guys ever go there? Mm-hmm. And um, Jessica, is, your, is it your contention that if Luke ever wants respect, then he'll earn respect and he'll, he'll rise up? Or, or does that ever enter your mind? I don't know. I don't necessarily feel like respect has been part of our conversation. I feel like we've, I, I feel like ours has been more of a like. Yeah, I don't feel like there's not mutual respect there. Communication. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I won't push you any further. I, 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 um, as we've talked about before, when one person is an internal uh, processor and the other person is an external processor, um, unless we learn to express our feelings, there's going to be conflict that's not resolved. And the other, the other thing is, uh, Luke, for you, Learning to be an empathetic listener. Sometimes it's difficult for us to be empathetic with our spouse when they are being firm with us. How come this is not done? Why didn't this get done? You were supposed to do this. You're always doing that. Uh, it's really hard for us to be empathetic when that's the approach that we're here. Okay, so I probably have meddled as much as I've ever uh, Anybody else want to share something while we're while we're sharing before we take off through the material? Um, it's just kind of bizarre because we're the exact but just different spouses. Like she's just like him and she's just like me. It's really weird. Even the parents are similar. Yeah. And Doug, your parents both were external processors. They got into an argument and they they worked it out to well, some degree. My dad was very introverted, but my mom would kind of force things to happen, and they would usually come. It would usually work out, but okay. her parents. But when your dad was pushed to a certain place, then he would respond. Yeah, but he was he would kind of he would hide as much as he could, but my mom would eventually get it out of him. 
Okay. So, yeah. So do you find yourself being a lot like that? Yeah. Oh, for sure. All right. Anybody else relate to where either of the, these couples are? So we'll go have dinner. <laughs> yes. yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think what you're going to understand is that as you understand more about the process of, of being productive and getting things done, being forceful and using words that, um, that accomplish things are hugely important. Let's, let's go through the material as fast as we can. Right. And then, yes. You got a question. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Peter. So I'm curious, um, we've talked a lot about the negative effects of our heritage from yes. our parents. Yes. A um, couple questions. First of all, do you ever have you ever found some a marriage that's functional where the 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 most most of what was handed down from the parents was actually useful and helpful? And then um, I guess that's really related. Is there a spectrum then too? I mean, is there on this side over here? This is functional, this is helpful, this isn't. Also, one other question, I guess, and that is, um, how do you deal with the expectations of the understanding of people? You even alluded to it yourself. You said if you, if you talk to your wife, she would disagree with you that her family was dysfunctional. She still thinks that her family is functional, but you don't think it is. I'm sure that's a major point of contention. Yeah. Well, the last thing you want to do is tell her, you're, you're acting just like your mom, because they're all dysfunctional. Yeah. <laughs> That'll get you all kinds of places. Those are good questions, Peter. Uh, here's what I believe about families. <clears throat> Every family has dysfunctional traits. By that I mean every family has things they have to work out. <clears throat> the functional families are the ones who learn to work through the issues. I want you to think about that for a little bit. Remember, <clears throat> we talked about the poo and the stall. Every family, there are very few people, when you think about all the differences that we, we get married with, <clears throat> you girls have certain expectations, we guys have certain expectations, and when you start insisting on your own thing, and <clears throat> uh, because you don't think something is right, and your husband disagrees with you, you have to be able to functionally work through that. Functional families have been taught as kids how to work out issues. Don't mean that there was not some dysfunctional traits. Every, every family has dysfunctional traits that they have to learn to work through. Now one of the things that, yes? And it's also, the, the opposite way around because our childhood was pretty dysfunctional but there's a couple of things my mom did right that are functional yes well <clears throat> you know as I shared with you uh, we did we, I, my wife and I both came from a dysfunctional family but we did some things right we read scripture Aaron has mentioned to me this to me a number of times dad you did a good job of reading scripture to me every day before I went to school. <coughs> you helped me to try to unravel life according to God's view. And he says, I'll always be grateful for that. But you know, as I watch Aaron, he has suffered from our own past generational sin. You do what you know. Yeah, but, you yeah, know, and, and you know, here's the thing. <coughs> Generational sin can stop in a generation if we recognize where we are and we decide that we're going to clean out the stall. We're going to let the Lord Jesus have control of our relationship. In order to do that, you've got, <clears throat> you've got to be willing to walk on it. Here we go again. <clears throat> Anybody want to add something? Does that, does that answer your question, Peter? Um, yeah, that's a good answer. I had the other piece of it that I think maybe we didn't talk about as much is um, what is are there positive traits? Are there is there a way to look at the heritage you get from your family and see things that are good? And then related to that, how do you deal with it when somebody sees something as positive that isn't? Because that happens, right? I'm not sure if I understand what you mean exactly. Um, okay, so let's let's take for instance. Um, 
your example of uh, mom kept a good house, right? And uh, turns out mom kept a good house, but that meant that nobody could live in the house. Pretty good. Uh, and your wife comes along and she's like, I'm not going to do with that. And you're like, well, but this is the way it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. And how does he, he needs to change his mind? Maybe she needs to learn how to keep better house. Maybe they need to come together. But somebody's got to. First of all, is that a positive thing? Is that is there something good about that keeping a good house, right? That expectation. Oh yes. Well, and we have lots of guys who grew up being workaholics because they were praised when they were little for doing things. Working is a good thing, but if you spend all your time working, I have in my in my cabinet in my office four hats. One says job, one says parent, one says spouse, and one says hobby. And lots of times I take them out and ask the person, particularly the husband, which one of these do you wear the most? Do you know how to take your job hat off and put your spouse hat on? Because the thing is, Peter is saying, the thing that is so positive, like hard work is a good thing. But if, if that's where you spend all your time, and your energy, then it becomes a bad thing because you never spend time with your family. Okay. So I guess the answer is just that we're going to, this is something, that, this is part of the communication process. Yeah, and you know, uh, coming back uh, class, and this is the hard part, we live in a generation that has lost the design of God in what we understand about what our roles are. Mm -hmm. If there are some innate qualities that we have, like we men have a need to conquer, we have a need, we have a need to be in charge. And I've had wives say, well, if, if he earns respect, then I'll pay him respect. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe part of the reason he's not earning respect is because you're the, you have convinced him that he that he's he doesn't deserve respect. He was raised in a home where he never had respect. If a gal grows up in a home where she was abused and never loved, and the husband takes advantage of that and just continues to maul her with all kinds of guilt about not keeping her house as clean as his mom did and those kind of things, then you are violating the very principle of Scripture that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And, and it just, as I've said before, pays all kinds of dividends. So in answer to your question, Peter, we have to come back to the question that, that is being what God wants me to be more important than being what I want to be? Is that true, sir? Is that, is that more important to you? To, to do what I want to do? To be what God wants you to be rather more important than what Sarah wants to be. Absolutely. Okay. So what that means is that if I understand that I'm being abusive to my husband and I'm controlling in my home, and I'm forcing him to be angry at me. I'm not saying that happens, but you know, it sounds like maybe that could happen. Uh, if I if I'm forcing him to be angry at me and withdrawing from me, then I've got to be willing to say, you know what? I'm probably I'm probably out of balance. Help me figure out what I need to do. But coming to that place, gosh, you you remember? You know how much stuff we have to lay aside in order to get to that place? I have to be willing to give up all the traditional things. And, and usually, Sarah, let me ask you another question. What's the number one fear in your life? The biggest fear you have in your life? Um, to lose my family. Rejection. Okay. I would almost bet the reason you like to be in control is because that helps you to understand your important. Because you have a deep fear of being rejected by your family. Any rest of you have a fear of rejection? Kelly, where did that come from? Well, my parents divorced, uh -huh. partly, and I was in a home where um, three older, very tough brothers, and so there was rejection when I was teased at school. Just there was rejection all over the place. So that's huge, you know, coming to my bed is a mm -hmm. big fear in my life, too. Mm -hmm. And I have some rejection going on in my life right now. So, um, and you know, the, what Peter's talking about is, is, a, is a good thing for us to analyze. 
The very thing that motivates Sarah to want to be in control is her fear. If she's not in control, she's out of control. We call those people codependent. They have a need to be needed by the people around them. And sometimes they have to insist that the persons recognize them as being important. If they don't recognize that, then we insist on it. Okay? I'll draw you a little picture. And let's say this is a tennis net, and the mom is over here, and <clears throat> here's dad and the kids. And the mom who grew up in a home where she got recognized because she kept the house clean, she kept everybody organized, that's how her, she got her <coughs> affirmation from her parents. Okay, it's like, a, it's like she's got a tennis racket in her hand. She hits the ball over here and she says, Saturday morning we're going to clean the house and get everything straightened up and everything done. <clears throat> but before they can hit the ball back, she runs around here and hits it back to herself. She goes and cleans the kids' room and the, and the house and everything else. And then she says what? What do you think she says? Why help me? Every once in a while when I have a class like this, I'll hear a wife say, if I didn't do everything around the house, nothing would ever get done. Well, all kinds of red flags start to go up when I hear that. Guess what she's saying? She needs to be needed by her family. She's willing to do all the work so that they can say we couldn't do without you, Mom. She does it in such an abrasive way, she offends everybody. Does that make sense? Can you relate to that, sir? Yes. <laughs> I've said those exact words. <laughs> oh, no, not you. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to have to hurry. We're going to be, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be late. We can talk about this. Uh, I want you to bring your questions next time we get together because there's questions running around in your brain right now that, that you're thinking about <clears throat> that you want to ask. Let's see if we can get through this as fast as possible. Number one, greatest need is safety and relationship. I've just shared with you from the family pot that that's every child's need. Greater, stronger than the need for sex or food or anything else is this need to have a safe relationship. If we grow up without a safe relationship, then, then we start looking for places of safety. Number two, when safety is, a th is threatened, these are some of the attributes that start to unfold, according to Jay Early in his book. One is addiction, perfectionism, performance, Codependency. What's that, one or A, B, and C? A, B, and C, sorry. Okay. A, B, and C is addiction. B is perfection. C is performance. D is codependency. <coughs> the next one, we can develop protectors. This is what he calls the protectors. <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, and six. Number one, manipulator or a schemer. That's supposed to be schemer. Uh, I believe schemer has two M's in it. Is that right? What's one? Is that right, Jessica? You're the school teacher. It sounds like a name. Schemer. Is it a name? Uh, no, it's a, it's a, it's a um, adjective. Schemes. S C H E M E S. Scheming. I don't know, I have to go and ask Siri. Uh, well, Siri you guys can just write down schemer and then uh, number two is a runner. <coughs> people, people who run away from. That's number two. Number one was a manipulator. These are the protectors. We, uh, and Mary, you were talking about the child who learns to manipulate everybody in the family. Uh, number two is a runner. Number three is a fixer. Number four is a blamer, or a victim, or a martyr. I got a guy that I'm working with. He has the whiniest voice. He just drives me up a wall. Uh, whenever I visit with him, well, I, I've really been trying. You know, I'm doing my best. That's exactly how it sounds. I'm doing my best. And I'll tell him, quit being a, a, a victim. 
fact, he even went somewhere this last week and was going to present himself to these people, and I said, don't go in with your whiny voice. Be a man, be brave. I don't, know, I don't know if he did or not, but he came out all right, I guess. Number four is a blamer, a victim, or a martyr. Number five is a judge or a critic. Which one of these fit you? Number six is an actor. And under actor, you can become a hero or the hardest worker. Or C is, again, the martyr. Now, <clears throat> on the next page, uh, this is what, what where the pain is created. Created pain can be the result of, number one, a feeling of worthlessness because you've been convinced when you were little that you're never going to manage up. Number two, the sad part. There can be a sad part of you that's sad all the time. You know anybody that's sad all the time? What's one? One is a worthless, feeling worthless, the worthless part. Two is the sad part. Three is an embarrassed part. And i got to tell you a personal story. When I was five years old, I went to school with a pair of bibbed overalls on with a hole in the seat and no underpants on. I was playing underneath the, I was playing underneath the floor. I can remember this like it was yesterday. I was playing cards under, you know, underneath the floor of the two little two-room schoolhouse. The kids are standing back laughing at me. That was 69 years ago, 67, 68 years ago. I still remember that as if it were real to me today. When I'm in, in, a, in our staff meeting and some of the staff starts to say little quips about uh, Charlie this or Charlie that, I become agitated inside. It makes me angry. Because I can still remember this, uh, this embarrassed part. And I hate being embarrassed. Any of you relate to that? Okay. Uh, number four is a fearful part. Something's happened to you that you're afraid of. Uh, somebody died. Somebody, uh, you saw somebody shoot somebody. Uh, there's... Uh, fearful part of being beaten or whatever. Number five is a rejected part. Number six is an angry part. Now I want to talk about this for just a second. Anger is a learned trait. Class, you got to hear this. Anger is a learned trait. For you to get angry, you've had to, you've had to be allowed or encouraged to be angry when you're little. How many of you have one or more parents that are angry? Okay. I'm telling you, James says that the anger of man works not the righteousness of God. <clears throat> anger is something that you are you are you have in your life that is a part of uh, what you witnessed whenever <clears throat> you were when you were little. And if you're not careful, you will allow the anger in your life to repel the people that are close to you. Usually anger is a secondary emotion. Okay, which is the first? Well, <clears throat> it depends on the person, it depends on the situation, it depends on the perceived threat. Or the perceived offense, right? Like if I'm sad, I can come out as anger because I want to protect my sad family. Okay. Or if I feel threatened or afraid or uncared for, okay. then I come across as anger. Yeah, but anger then becomes, gives us an excuse not to accept the responsibility of whatever we feel bad about. Right, or feel what we have to feel underneath that all. There you go. Okay, here's the recognize uh, the reprogram. We have to kind of reprogram our brain to God's design. And this is what Peter was alluding to a little bit ago. Class, you do not have to, Sarah, you do not have to be codependent. The Lord wants to set you free from that. i got to tell you, uh, <clears throat> my wife didn't like this very well. If she were here to defend herself, I wouldn't be able to say half of what I'm saying. <clears throat> but uh, she was just going on one day, and I said, you know, I was really helpful. I said, you need to let the Holy Spirit sweeten up your spirit a little bit. <coughs> well, that went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> <coughs> I have learned since 
Not, <laughs> not to say, not to accuse her of being outside the will of God. You, you want to get on her bad side? That's the way to do it. Okay, number one, identify the issues. Now, class, I've tried to help you identify the issues. If you want to come and see me in private, we will go through some other issues in your relationship, in your person, so that you can allow the Lord to change. I'm telling you, God will deliver you from the things that, will, that you are, that's creating issues in your life, that's causing you to be disliked by your spouse or even your kids. When you're angry a lot or when you're controlling, you get to the place where you feel like... Now, sir, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. I'm glad you you don't mind me asking you a personal question. <laughs> I'm glad you'll let us be. Do you, do you, is there any kids? You're welcome. Uh, do you have kids? I have a stepson. Okay. Is, is he ever afraid of you? No. Okay. Are you ever hard on him? Sometimes. What's he do when you're hard on him? Um, she kind of withdraws, actually. Now, is he close to you? Yes. Good. Yes, we have so. a very, very special relationship. Good, good, good. Well, it doesn't sound like that you, that you, as my son said about me, that I was overbearing. Oh. <laughs> Uh, which I vehemently disagree with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number two, own your part of your past. You have to be able to own the part of you, whether it's generational sin or whatever it is. If I always ask couples, okay, you come to see me because there are some issues that you're dealing with, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. If that's true, then something has to change. If what you're doing <coughs> is not working, it's a no-brainer to say, well, gosh, if we just keep doing the way we are, when we're, when we're married 53 years, it'll get better. Uh-uh. It don't get better unless you decide you want to be in the center of God's will. Uh, recognize, you recognize whatever it is as generational sin. If it's that, continue to submit yourself, uh, submit it to God's direction. And we talked last week from 1 Peter how Jesus modeled for us what it's like to be in a certain place. What was number four, Charlie? Sorry. Uh, number four is uh, submit it to God's direction. What was three? Number three was recognize as generational sin. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to pick on you again. Okay. <laughs> Do you like it when you're overbearing? No. You like yourself? No, not when I take a step back and realize what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Now the question you have to ask yourself is, and I gotta leave you with this verse. In John chapter five, Jesus comes to the pool of Bethesda. When we were in uh, when we were in Jerusalem, we actually drove right by this pool. If you remember the story, this fellow had had, he had been lame from birth or whatever, but he had some people carry him there. Jesus comes to him and says, um, asks him a simple question, do you want to be healed? Now according to tradition, <clears throat> there was evidently a geyser in the pool of Bethesda. It's all kind of crumpled in now. We didn't stop there, but we could see it from distance and it had stuff in it and that kind of stuff. But according to tradition, in that day and time, there was a geyser or something in the pool that when it would come up, the first person that got into the pool was healed. They said an angel troubled the water and when they went into the pool, they were able to be healed. Jesus questioned this fellow who had some guys bring him there, do you want to be healed? And guess what, his, what he said? Yeah, no, he said, no, I, I want to be healed, but I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. Now, class, just think about that. These guys brought him there. Somebody brought him there. Somebody could have thrown him into the pool. My guess is he liked where he was at. He did not want to change. He liked being taken care of. 
He liked it because it made him comfortable. He had cut out a groove in life that made him feel comfortable. And guess what Jesus did? Jesus healed him. Now today, God wants to heal you. He wants to make your marriage better. And the only way you can do that is you've got to mold yourself in the image of Jesus. And class, I know that you'd expect that from a preacher, but I've been doing this for 41 years. And the people who say, Lord, it's not about me anymore, it's about what you want me to do, <clears throat> those are the ones who find you. Make sense? Absolutely. All right. Gosh, you're a good listening class. I wish we had three more hours. I'd let Laura teach for a little while. <laughs> All right, let me pray. And we're, we're through. Father, we are we're grateful for your healing in our lives. And Lord, we know that in all of our flaws and all of our human frailties, that you love us where we are. God, help us not to hide behind the pain that's in our life. Help us to recognize the pain that's been created by someone else's sin, generational sin or wherever, and to understand that when we mold ourselves in the image of Jesus, that we start walking on the cutting edge of grace and forgiveness as Jesus came full of grace and truth. Uh, Lord, I pray that for every person that's here today, for every spouse who has come wanting to know what your design for our life is, that we're discovering it. When you want us to model after Jesus, for our kids and for each other. So Lord, help us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming.